Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true. So we looked at that a couple weeks ago. Whatever is honorable. We looked at that last week. Today we look at this. Whatever is just. Circle just. And in your Bible, right next to the word just, write, write, write W-R-I-T, the word right. R-I-G-H-T. Because that's what the word just means right there. Doing the right thing. Whatever is pure. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Circle, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice. Circle, practice. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Let me ask you a question. I asked you this question two weeks ago. I asked you this question. How do you know what is true? How would you know if you were going to navigate your life? This is a true thing. I should believe this. How would you know something is true? So watch. I'm going to jump back two weeks because it's going to go along with what we're talking about today. I'm going to lay a foundation. Ready? Here we go. How do I know what's true? I know God is true. If there's, if there's a being in the universe that's true, I'm not true because my emotions go up and down. I'll make bad calls. I'll make bad choices. I can even know something's true and choose against it. But is there a way to know always that something is true that I can make a choice about? Yep, God is true. So because God is true and he doesn't change, the reason God is true, the reason this is a true statement about God being true is that God doesn't change. I change. Someday maybe you'll come to my funeral. I die. I get sick. I I, I head head down in, in health. So God isn't like me. God has never been created. He never had a start He wasn't born or birthed. He doesn't decay over time. He doesn't get sick. He doesn't have bad days. God eternally is true because of his nature. And I can trust that he is true. Watch. From God, from God then who is true comes true things, which is God's word. Out of God comes true things because he can't be anything other than who he is because he never changes. He doesn't morph. So From him can't help but come true things, which is God's word, which is why we call it God's word, which is why I'm teaching God's word. So watch, if if I don't know what truth is, I can look to true things, which comes from a true God. Here's the reason I tell you that. Same thing is true about what is right. If I was to ask you this question, how do you know what's right? If I was to ask you a question, how do you know what's right in any given circumstance? Most of our culture, if you ask them on Twitter or TikTok or went to the mall or whatever, most of our culture would say, I navigate what is right or wrong in my life by how I feel in the moment. And how I feel, what is right for me is right for me. So I choose how I feel. And if it's right for me, I know it's right. Here's the problem with that. When you've got millions of people going, I'm going to choose what's right based on how I feel. And other people go, that's wrong. You've got dysfunction. You've got chaos in a culture where everybody, nobody can decide on what's right. And usually the way we decide what's right in our culture is who screams the loudest. We live in a cancel culture. So whoever screams the loudest, that's wrong! Cancel them! Hashtag cancel orchard. (laughs) Then all of a sudden everybody goes, everybody gets scared by the screamer and goes, I guess that must be right because you're screaming the loudest. So I'm scared. I'm intimidated by your screaming online, by your, by your, by your capitals. <laughs> and I don't want people mad at me and screaming at me. So we're, we're cool, right? As long as you get your way. Listen, any culture that navigates truth by whoever screams the loudest is, a, is living in chaos. And that's the culture we're in now. You want to know the reason we feel that weird anxiety in our culture about everything? Just pick a social justice issue, pick climate change, pick a president, pick a, just pick something. Everybody's got different opinions and everybody's screaming about their opinion. When you live in that kind of culture, trying to navigate truth, you live in chaos, which is why we feel it in our culture right now. And we have felt it for 10 years, 15 years, or basically ever since the internet hit the interwebs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you today. Here's my, here's my goal today. Listen to me. I want to remove chaos out of your life. I want you to know what's true so you can act on what's true so that you can live a life of freedom in front of God. Everybody with me? That's my goal. So when you hit that door today, I hope I ho- totally change the way you, you view life. That's my goal. So pull your notes out. 
You should have gotten them in your bulletin if you came in uh, to our campus. If you're watching online, at the top of the comment section on Facebook is a link. Click on that link and my notes will drop down. And number one in our notes is this, God does what is right. God does what is right. So everybody walk with me. I know it's third service and you're thinking about lunch already, but hang with me. So look at me. I'm gonna take, watch, here's what we're gonna do. at the front end, watch. We're gonna go to the deep end of the pool. We're gonna swim there for a little bit and then we're gonna come back to practical. So I'm gonna walk into the deep water of theology and philosophy, but we're not gonna stay there. We're gonna come back to application. But I want, I want, you, I want to set a stage for what I'm gonna talk about. Because if, if you don't understand what I'm gonna talk about right here, you're gonna go, Who, where's this foundation for what is right? Like you're just telling me, don't do that thing. But how do I know you're even right? How do I even know what you're talking about, pastor, is even right? Like where's the foundation about what you're saying? So we're gonna go back here and build a foundation. And here's, here's my premise. God does what is right. How can I prove that? Look at this. God's eternal character, in other words, who he is, is the foundation of how truth can be known. So that's just what I got done talking about. God is true, so I can know true things. He never changes. He doesn't lie. He doesn't try to rip you off. He doesn't change his mind. One day say, do this thing. Oh, I was just kidding. Do this thing. God isn't like us. He isn't all over the map emotionally making weird calls in our, in our lives. He's not like us. Praise God. Praise, praise him for being him, right? <laughs> so I can know true things. What's, how do I know true things? Because God is true. Watch this. The outworking of God's truth is what is right. If God is true and he wants something in the world to be done, I know that what he's asking me to do is the right thing to do. Because if God is true, that means he's right. His nature is right. He doesn't lie or try to rip me off. He's telling me the right thing to do. That's why I can know true things. God is right. He tells me what's right in the world through his word. If I'm wrong, I can look to what's right and change my life. That's literally how to navigate your life. I don't know what's right. I'm not right, but I can know right because God is right. If God is right and he speaks right in the world, I can know right when I'm wrong and I can choose to change or not. That's literally how you can navigate your life. God doesn't randomly decide what is right based on his feelings, but what is right is naturally produced from who he is. God proclaims what is right, and that standard for moral beings like us, like humans, me and you, defines if a person is righteous or not. So everybody walk with me. Throughout the scripture, it says this, oh, she was a righteous woman, or he was a righteous man. They did righteous things. And we look at that and we go, Dude, that's like some religious -y word. Like, that's like holy people that get a statue at the Catholic church or whatever. Like, that's not me. I'll never be like holy person. Actually, that's not what righteous means. Let me help you. Righteous in scripture is never a religious word. Righteous in scripture is a practical word, which means, are you doing the right thing, son? Are you doing the right thing? No, I'm not doing the right thing. Then you're not righteous. Are you doing the right thing, son? I'm totally following God. Then you're righteous. Literally in the word is the word, in the word righteous is the word right. You do, you do the right thing, you're righteous. It's, a, it's not a matter of like, oh, I'm, I'm just trying to be holy and righteous. Someday I'll eclipse the righteousness of the sun. <laughs> All it means is this, are you doing the right thing or not? I am doing the right thing. Then you're righteous. If you're doing what God wants, you're a righteous person. If you're not doing what God wants, you're unrighteous. So it's not a religious word, it's a practical word. So watch, if you do the right thing, you're like God because he is, he is righteous. He does the right thing always because his character is eternal and it never changes. I am not. I can even know what's right and do evil. God can't do that. God can't do evil because he's always perfect and righteous. His nature doesn't change. My nature's all over the map. But watch this, I can be righteous because I know what's right, because God has made it clear through his word. We can know what is right, here's our principle, because God is right. We can know what is right because God is right. Look at um, Psalm 19, verse eight. 
Psalm 19, verse 8 says this. The precepts or the laws of the Lord, the things that he, let, he wants us to do, the precepts of the Lord are what? Right. Rejoicing the heart. You know what's weird? Is we, we live with a lot of shame. Listen to me. You want to know why you hate feeling shameful? Because you're built to know when things are wrong in your life. So we have a culture of, you know, shaming. People yell about shaming online, like, oh, your body's shaming her, or, you know, you're, you're shaming me. What, they're, what, be, what people are trying to say in our culture is this. You're making me feel bad about myself. Stop doing that. That's, that's what people are trying to say. Here's what I'm saying. Shame is an appropriate reaction when you've done something wrong. So our culture says this. Hey, don't make me feel bad about myself. Stop that. But watch, healthy shame is this. I've done something wrong against God. I should feel bad. Our culture says, don't make me feel bad or I'll yell at you online. So how do I deal with my shame if I feel shamed? Is I make you feel bad about shaming me. So I yell so at I you, yell, stop, stop making me stop feel bad me about feel myself. How in the world can you help people not feel bad about themselves if they should feel legitimate shame? Some things we shouldn't feel shame about, like body shape or whatever. Like some of those are legitimate, like stop bullying people, okay? But there's a whole other aspect to shame is this. When I've done something bad or evil and I've sinned against God, I should feel bad. Shame is that weird feeling you feel when you go, gosh, I feel like dirty, like... There's this weird darkness, this dissonance, dysfunction in myself where I go, why do I feel like this when I did that thing? So shame is appropriate reaction to going, I've done something wrong against God. God is right. I haven't acted right. I feel bad. That's appropriate shame. And here's the reason I tell you that. You're built to honor God. You know why you're built to honor God? I can tell you why. Because you have a moral nature that tells you when something's wrong or right. Sometimes people will say, oh, it's just culture telling us what's right or wrong. Nope. Literally, if you live by yourself, you could have thoughts like, shouldn't have done that. I mean, I kicked the cat. That was fine. But there's other things I shouldn't have done. There's, I mean, speaking of right. So what I'm saying is, you can live totally separate from culture all by yourself in the woods, have never lived with another person your whole life. You grew up with wolves. And you still would go, why did that wolf eat all my food? You still have a moral nature going, that wolf just stole all my food. My wolf brother or whatever, whoever you grew up with. <laughs> like you still would go, that was wrong. Now the, watch this. The wolves would go, everybody for themselves, bro. Like, we have no moral need to feed your face. But you would go, I have a moral re reality where you stole stuff from me. But animals have no, no feeling about that because animals and insects are totally different than humans. Why? One of that aspect is the morality we feel. And when we break morality, we feel shame. I shouldn't have thought that. I should stop gossiping. Why do I keep texting and sharing all that stuff? I don't even know if it's true. And God keeps convicting me about gossiping about other people's business. Like the whole internet's built on gossip. And I feed right into it. I literally do evil. I share stuff about people. I don't even know if it's true. And I'm like destroying people's reputation. It's called gossip. It's called slander. It's evil. It's sin. And we do it without even thinking about it. Because our culture is evil. It loves gossip because gossip sells Gossip gets clicks. Slander pays. And you should, and I should feel rightly bad about, dude, I just said that about that person. I have, I have zero idea if that's even real. And even if it is real, should I even share that? Is that even my business? Would I want somebody sharing that about me? So we should feel legitimate shame when God is calling us on the carpet for things we've done wrong. I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, my whole staff sitting out on those picnic tables. We were cleaning up something around the church or whatever. And I hear this. I 
I'm like, what is that? Just like you're saying right now. I'm like, what is that? Well, a queen bee had flown and landed on this exterior overhang. The problem was she brought about 10,000 of her friends with her. And this monster ball of bees was flying with her. It was massive. And they landed right here on the outside of this overhang. And here was the thing. The queen, I don't know how she got them all to do this, your pheromones or whatever she's floating around, like everybody's following her in this big ball flying around. Well, she lands there. And the thing is, she didn't ask permission from the owner of the property. <laughs> and honestly, I was offended. I'm like, what are you doing? You can't just bring a thousand of your people here to our church like, and literally land on a building we own. You just, I, I was offended. You didn't ask, you didn't call ahead, you didn't email. Um, I, I, was, I was offended that you just thought you could come onto private property and go, here's where I'm gonna build a home. No head up, no warning, no asking, no nothing. Not only that, but her little friends that came with her were really irritated <laughs> about anybody that anybody, got close. Anybody, anybody. So she basically told her peeps, I want you to light up whoever gets close to me. <laughs> on my property, on our property, like on private property, they're ready to sting people who are getting close. And I want you to understand something. The queen and those bees, no moral compass at all. They're just totally living off how God built them. It's survival instinct. Humans are not like that. We have a moral nature that goes, I probably shouldn't do that. That was wrong. I shouldn't sleep around. I feel, I feel, I feel sick about myself when I sexually do things that I know God doesn't approve of. I feel, I feel like, I feel evil. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Like, all oh, my friends are going, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But I know it's not fine. I feel shame. And nobody has to tell me to feel shame. Like, I feel it in myself. Ready? Bees have none of that. Rodents have none of that. Dogs have none of that. Antelopes, whales, they have none of that. You're not a highly evolved ape with a, a common ape ancestor. You are, a, you are a special creation of God built with a stamp of morality. And that doesn't come from culture. That comes from God. I want you to understand something. I'm laying a foundation here because I want you to understand what is right doesn't come randomly from culture or from God just making it up. It's true because he is true. And when we don't act true, we feel broken inside. And that's an element of saying, get your life right. You know how you deal with shame? Let me help you. I'm gonna lift the shame right out of your life right now. When you feel shame, immediately repent. The minute you feel shame, I shouldn't have done that, immediately repent. That's God's way of saying, get right. Keep, keep a short account with God. The minute your conscience, the minute you, you, you've done something wrong, I shouldn't have done that. I, sh I gossiped. I, I swore. I smoked pot again. I swore I wouldn't do that. I, I got caught in porn again. I just, I feel bad about everything I'm doing. Immediately repent. God, help me not to go there. God, help me not get rid of those friends. God, help me to not swipe right and swipe left to find a mate. God, help me. I repent of my sin. You want, you want to know how to get rid of shame? Repentance removes shame. Repentance removes shame. Here's the problem. Here's the Some problem. of us have Some... lived with shame for years and it's become so common to us, we don't even recognize shame anymore. Many of us have lived years and decades in shame because we don't want to live the way God wants us to live. Which leads us to number two, ready? Number one, God does what is right. Number two, I will do what is right. Paul encourages the Philippians to focus on the things that are right or just. It's translated just in your, in, your, in your Bible, but it basically means do the right thing. Focus on whatever is right. Righteous actions for humans are things that conform to God's perfect standard, which is found in Scripture. And here's our principle. The Bible is God's revelation of what is right. Woo! True story. I'm sitting in my college philosophy class. It's about 50 of us in there. And um, in philosophy, it's popular to try to figure out how do you know something's right in a particular situation? So in other words, if you, we would say, if you walked into a nursery and slaughtered a child, we would go, that seems wrong. But how do you know that's actually wrong? 
to go, to go murder an innocent child. We, we would appeal to, it's against the law. Okay, well, what if we change the law to, it's okay to murder innocent children in a nursery? Uh, that seems weird, but if it was lawful, that still seems wrong, but I can't figure out why that's wrong other than it feels wrong to me. Okay, well, what if it's not wrong to somebody else to go do that? What if they wanted to walk into your nursery in your home and kill your child? It's wrong to you, but it's not wrong to him. So you have to be okay with his, his moral uh, compass, right? Because yours just says it's wrong, but his doesn't. So just let him do whatever he wants to do. And we still go, well, if, it's, if, it's, if the law says it's okay, and I think it's wrong, how can I tell him that it's, that it's wrong? And so philosophy tries to get us to figure out, hey, how do you know something's wrong in a given situation? I'm in class. And, uh, and the philosophy professor goes, is anybody here that believes in God? To which like me and a small rodent that was running on the thing, <laughs> raise hand. I go, I do. I was one of the only ones in class. And you know, some of the rest of people and kids in class are like, oh God, here's the religious guy that, uh, God this, God that, yeehaw. <laughs> that was almost literally what they said when I raised my hand. And he goes, okay, good. Let's, let's take this for a second. Let's assume there's a God. Let's just do a thought experiment. Let's assume there's a God. I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying let's assume there's one. How does God know what is right? How does God figure out what's right? So I just gave you a thought experiment. Literally, if there's no morality that oversees all of humanity, then it's all individual. And, and the strongest person wins. If they want to come into your nursery and murder your children, I hope you're strong enough to stop them. Because if it's legal for people to wander into your nursery and kill people, now you can't even appeal to the law. So who are you appealing to? There's literally nobody except your own standard for morality. So watch, the reason you know something's wrong is because you expect it to be wrong for them too. How can I say it's wrong for them and wrong for me if there's no God? Anyway, so I'm sitting there in class. I jumped ahead of myself. And here's it's a true story. He goes, how, do you, how does God know what's wrong to tell us if, it's right, if something's right or wrong? So the, the philosophy professor tried to make a false dichotomy which a false dichotomy is this, basically giving you two options and they're both wrong to force you to go, there's no answer to this, except there is. So he, he gave two options. He goes, how does God know something is right or wrong? So God either chooses something to be right or wrong, however he figures it out. So murder might be wrong on Tuesday, but Wednesday he's like, you know what, murder's okay. I was just joking about Tuesday. So we don't actually know what's wrong because God could just choose something. Rape is wrong on Wednesday, but it's okay on Saturday. And God just kind of goes, oh, I don't know. I just kind of figure it out as I go. And we kind of go, that's weird. Like, if, is God really that all over the map? So either God chooses what's right or wrong whenever he feels like it, or right is outside of God and God just appeals to what is right and tells people about it. So right and wrong is like kind of, it's like a moral thing that's like outside of God and God just kind of appeals to the thing that's right. We don't even know like what that is. So the philosophy professor tried to say, believing in God is, is basically foolish. Like the, the God of the Bible is foolish to believe in him because if God is capricious and just kind of makes up right or wrong every other day or whatever, then you don't want to believe in that God because you don't even know what kind of God you're getting every other day. And if right or wrong is outside of God, then God's not all powerful. He's just like appealing to some other ethic out there somewhere. Who even knows what that is? And here's what I told him. I go, actually, both of those are wrong. You actually, there's a third option you didn't give. And the third option is the biblical option, which actually makes the most sense of the world. The biblical option is this. God is eternal in his nature, and he never changes and he never makes mistakes. So what comes out of him is naturally right all the time. So I can appeal to his moral eternal nature as knowing what's right and wrong. And I can say to the person that walks into the nursery and wants to murder my child, even if it's legal to murder my child, to say that's wrong because it's wrong to God. 
who oversees him and me and the person in Afghanistan and the person in Marietta and even Hemet. So understand, listen to me, ready? I, 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 I did that huge, heavy lifting philosophically on the backside to let you know you literally can know true things. And it's God who is true and his eternal nature will always be the same. He doesn't change. Rape's not wrong on one day and right on the next day or murder on one day and wrong on the next. God is always the same, always consistent. We change, but he never changes. So the reason I tell you all that is this. You can know truth, live it out. You can know what's right, do the right thing in your life and God will bless you. Here we go. To help, God has given people a moral compass called a conscience. But a conscience isn't God and can't be relied on to always know what is right. It can become calloused and evil and needs to be trained by scripture. Uh-oh, everybody pay attention. I know I walked into some deep waters. Some of you guys checked out and think about in and out. Come back to me. Listen to me. Ready? Here we go. How do I know what's right? Most of our culture would say, I go with my feelings. What feels right for me in this moment is this, and I do it. Other people would say this. It's not really my feelings, but I, I, I let my conscience guide me. Here's the problem with that. Your conscience isn't God. Your conscience can be wrong. Literally, your conscience can be evil. So God gave us a conscience. When that bee, when that queen bee brought 10,000 of her friends to hang out on our patio, and I said, that's wrong. The bee didn't have any moral compass. If, if, we, if, she, if I left those bees here for your children, and the bees are like, this is not, this is, this is, you know, and your kids are going into like anaphylactic shock and they can't breathe or whatever, the bees don't go, you know what? Wow, we should probably care about children. They just go, we're going to light you up, son. You get close to us. Oh, you want some more? Oh, you want some more? Oh, you want some more? Bees have no conscience, no moral nature. But people do. You know the reason I got rid of those bees? It's because I literally don't want them stinging your children. Why? Because I have a conscience. I don't just put your kids out there and go, I didn't really think about that. What happened? <laughs> Dude, they're bees. They're bees. Like you're responsible, Pastor Jim. You like little kids run around with like wasps. I didn't really know. I thought the bees would like self-control. <laughs> no, they're going to rip people up. So here's my point. Ready? You have a conscience in your, in, your, in your soul that goes, don't do that. Stop doing that. I don't have to be there to tell you. Even God doesn't have to be there to tell you. He, there, you have a moral nature in yourself that goes, that was wrong. It's a compass that goes, no, we're off. Okay, that feels, that's better. Oh, no, we're off. Ready? Here's the problem. Your conscience, you can defile your conscience to the point where your conscience stops telling you things are wrong. That's where we get psychopaths from. That's where we get sociopaths from, where they go, I'm going to kill everybody in this mall. Why are, you, why are you killing everybody? They're strangers to you. What have they ever done to you? Well, I just know that everybody that goes to the mall should die. And we recognize, oh, well, a conscience isn't true for everybody. Like literally, you can abuse your conscience to the point where it doesn't even tell you stop doing that anymore. Ready? Let me help you. Always keep your conscience sharp. You know how you keep your conscience sharp? Is tr train it by scripture. Your conscience can be trained. If your conscience has stopped telling you to stop doing drugs because you've been doing it for so long and your conscience has just gone, I give up. After a while, your conscience just goes, I'm done. You keep sleeping around, you keep doing whatever, you keep sexually abusing yourself. And you just, after a while, your conscience goes, I'm not even gonna tell you it's wrong anymore because it doesn't matter. You know how you retrain your conscience? is you always go back to scripture. Let scripture tell you this is right and wrong and you can literally train your conscience to be sharp again. Your conscience is your helper to go, stop doing that thing. Why? Because I don't want to feel shame. Stop feeling shame. Come back to God. God loves you. Stop doing that thing. Come on, come back. Let's walk with God. That's what your conscience is there for. Bees, nothing. Rodents, nothing. Some people in Hemet, nothing. <laughs> Sorry, Hemetites. Give you another example. Ready? When me and my wife, we had, uh, we had trouble getting pregnant. And um, so we were, it was years. It was just me and my wife. So if you're, if you're a couple, you kind of feel like we should start taking care of something. Let's like, let's practice being parents. Like even in our culture, we got to, it just drives me crazy. 
we're pet parents. You know, whatever. <laughs> well, we were pet parents. And we, here's, what, here's what we thought. You know what? Which pet parents is the lamest. Your pets are not children, so stop. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> Everything I just got done talking about. Your pets are not moral. They're not eternal. Moving on. So we go to pet, uh, Petco. Was it Petco? I think it was Petco. And there's a dog in the, in the kennel there, a rescue dog. So this dog is part pit, part Char- Sharpe, part chocolate lab. It's a disaster of a dog. <laughs> it's, got, it's got wiry hair. It's got long, nasty claws. It's got this weird jowl thing going on. So we walk in there. There's a reason nobody's adopted this dog yet. It looks like a demon. I mean, it's just, it's funky. I'm being serious. You look at the thing, you go, gee, what just happened? So me and my wife go in, for reasons still unknown to us today, we go, that dog needs a home. It's a true story. So we bring this dog home. This dog is, is wild. I mean, part pit bull, right? Part, part uh, uh, Sharpe. So if you know anything about those breeds, they need to know their boundaries. They need to know who's the alpha male or else they will be the alpha male. And, that, and things go bad when that happens. When they, when they think I'm making the rules here, that's when bad things happen to dogs who are powerful. So I trained that dog, dog that came off the street. It had no rules like I'm gonna bite somebody over here. <laughs> the dog's just going nuts. I mean, I couldn't believe they didn't put the dog down, but they decided to try again. And so it was us. So I trained that dog literally for a couple of years. And you know what happened? That dog went from, I, do, I make my own rules to I understand the rules and I understand how to be blessed in this home. And I align myself. I'm not the alpha male. I'm actually way back here behind all the humans in the home. <laughs> and so he, he, she, Zoe, understood her place in the home and she acted appropriately. And her, her, she realized when I act appropriately, I'm blessed. When I act out of line, then I get put back into my place. But guess what? It kept order and there was blessing for all of us. Your conscience is like a pet where if you don't train it, it'll just tell you to do whatever. But when you train it with scripture, it helps you get in the pathway of God's blessing. Literally your conscience is, you can train your conscience to either do evil or good. How do I train my conscience? To get to know what God wants for my life and then let my conscience guide me as long as it's following scripture. Leads us to our last point. I will help others know what is right. Number one, God always does what is right. Number two, I will do what is right. How do I know what's right? Get in scripture. I'm teaching scripture right now to you to help you understand what is right. Why? Because I I want you to honor God and I want God to bless your life. You can't have God bless your life if you don't know what's right. What does he want from me? How should I act in God's house? Lastly, I will now help others know what is right. After people learn what is right from God's word and start to practice it, they're to help others learn. Hey, who has kids in here? Who has rugrats or even old rugrats in your home? Okay, where are my grandparents? I got grandparents in here. Awesome. So let me help you. If you're single or you're young and you're like, dude, kids are so far off in my future. Awesome. There's a really good chance you might have your own little puppy someday in your home. Okay. So let me help you. So whether you're single, you're like, dude, this doesn't apply to me at all. It actually does. Because at some point you will either have your own kids. And so let me help you right now. Or somebody you know will have kids and you can help them. Watch. People don't know what is right unless they are taught what is correct. You are not born. God doesn't just download the truth into your mind and you just can kind of walk around going, I know what's right in every circumstance. It's the reason he gave us God's word. Even though we've got the Holy Spirit, he's given us God's word. Why? Because we need to be trained in what's true. So parents, let me help you. You are destroying your kids' lives when you let them run your home. You are destroying your kids' lives when you care about their happiness more than their holiness. We, including myself, I'm not poking at you, I'm poking at me too, ready? We live in a culture of our kids' rule. They rule our emotions. We don't want little Johnny to feel bad. And he starts to feel bad and we go, who did it? 
My son's 58 and I'm gonna light somebody up. We live in this weird mama bear world where the minute our kids are mad, dude, mom and dad are gonna come fix it. Let me help you. Ready? The way you teach your kids is the way they will live their life. If you teach your kids life is about them and their pleasure and their happiness, you will destroy them because they will think for the rest of their lives, what is right is how I feel. Rather than saying, son, I want you to honor God. Even though I'm your father, God built you, not me. So honor God with your life, son, and God will bless you. Honor, honor God with your life, daughter, because God loves you as a young woman of God. So do the right thing and God will bless you. What is the right thing, my daughter? Here are the ways that God wants you to live your life. To be a woman of God, do these things. To be a man of God, do these things. Your kids will not learn by osmosis. Your kids need to actually learn. When your kids become of dating age, it, what's really sad is sometimes parents start just tapping out when their kids are teenagers because they get just too crazy. Ready? You need to sit down with your kids and go, sweetie, how are you choosing what guys to date and what pictures to send? Like, where's your, what, what, what level of discernment are you using to like take your clothes off and send scandalous pictures because you want attention or you want people to love you or whatever? Like, how are you processing that, babe? Let's walk through that. Let's walk through how we, know, we can know what's right. Young man, son, are you asking for pictures that are inappropriate? What's wrong with you? Be a man of God. I know it makes you happy in the moment, but that's it's degrading to you and her. And it doesn't set a good example. If you want, are you going to invite her to church? <laughs> Let's go to youth group so we can all look at the pictures you sent me. Like, be, be a man of God, son. And God will bless you. Control yourself. Guess what? Your kids will not know if you let Twitter teach them what's right. You literally need to teach them what's right and wrong. And I'm in the same boat. I've got a 21-year-old. I've had to walk him through a mess of just our culture. I get it. I'm not saying it's easy. What I'm saying is it's your responsibility. Walk your sons and daughters through what's right. And watch, ready? Because many of us feel guilty about our past. Like we screwed up. We, we could be talking to kids that we had out of wedlock and we're telling our kids, hey, wait till you're married. <laughs> and they're like, dad, I'm older than your marriage. What are you talking about? So watch, ready? Let me help you navigate that. Let me help you navigate that. Here's all you have to do. Be honest with your older teenage kids and go, hey, I didn't do things right. I didn't know Jesus. I wasn't living for God. I want you to. I have a lot of heartache that came along with a lot of sin. So I'm not telling you to do these things because I'm righteous and holy and I'm better than you. I'm telling you, I want you to live differently than I lived because I could have saved myself a lot of heartache if I would have lived for God. So that's my heart for you as my daughter or as my son. See how you navigate that? You're not, you don't tell people what to do because you're more holy than them. You say, let's all do this together. Let's all live for God together and God will bless our lives. God will bless our home. Ready? Here's our principle and we're done. People see God the best when they see him in God's people the most. Woo! Hey, you want the greatest joy out of life? Be used by God to do something great in the world. Listen to me. The pleasure you will get out of being used by God is indescribable. There is joy you can have in your life that you will never get from sex, from being popular on Instagram, from getting the job you always dreamed of or retiring or whatever. There's a joy from God that's indescribable when he uses you to do something great in the world in other people's lives. Understand, people will see God the best when they see him and God's people the most. Shine for Jesus this week. Do what is right and God will bless you and help others to know what is right as well.